going to uh, be in the 25th chapter of Matthew today, and I think we'll go through the whole chapter. Depends on how things go. Last couple of weeks, I don't know which day it was, my uh, grandson, Nehemiah, and I were went shopping to our favorite store, the uh, Gander Mountain store. And uh, I got him out of his car seat. I set him on the parking lot, got myself ready, and I went to take his hand. He said, self, self. He wanted to do his own walking across the parking lot. Well, uh, Grandpa's not going to let that happen. As we're looking through this uh, 25th chapter of Matthew, we're going to see some people that wanted to do it themselves. But I'll tell you what, folks. When Christ comes, we want to be included in all that he has for us. We don't want to be excluded from the glories and the, and the privileges of heaven. Uh, before we start, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this great day. Thank you for this group of folks. Lord, help us to be a blessing to one another. Help us to, uh, help us to be so in love with you that we want to be like you, that we want our thoughts to be like your thoughts, that we want to will the same things that you will. We want your your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, and we want to be an enthusiastic part of that. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. And thank you for your incredible love and for your promise that you would uh, return and set everything right at the end. And be with us today as we look into that. In Christ's holy name we pray, amen. All right, Matthew 25. I'm going to start off reading the first uh, 13 verses. Um, I've got a new American standard here. Uh, maybe, I should, maybe I should read it in the NIV, since most of you have the NIV. The tricky part is my markers are in the new American standard. Matthew, 25th chapter, verses 1 through 13. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was, not a long, was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. <laughs> Did you hear that? <laughs> That was that trumpet at midnight. Uh, thank you, Meredith. <laughs> then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both of us, for both you, us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others came, also came. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I'll tell you the truth, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. Uh, parables are interesting teachings. Uh, there's a lot of uh, really valuable stuff in them, but they're also uh, 
Um, we can get a lot out of them that's wrong. For instance, remember the, the parable of the um, unrighteous judge. The uh, petitioner comes before him over and over and over and over and over, and finally the unrighteous judge relents and gives him whatever it was he's petitioning for. Uh, the point of a parable, a parable often just gives us a main point. If we look at every point in that uh, example I just gave, the parable of the unrighteous judge, God is an unrighteous judge. If, we, if we're going to take every part of that parable as, as uh, teaching doctrine. And we can do that with uh, any parable we read. And so we, can, we need to be careful when uh, applying what we're reading in parables. We need to, number one, what's the main teaching in a, in a parable? And that is pretty much solid. Uh, some parables you can, uh, you can um, apply other parts, but um, uh, once you get past the main teaching of the parable, you're kind of on shaky grounds. So what's the main teaching of this parable of the ten virgins? Be ready. Be ready. Uh, Be alert, he says in verse 13. I've got to get rid of this Bible. I've got too many Bibles ahead of me here. So in this, in this uh, parable, who would be the uh, bridegroom? Now, I just warned us about applying too much in a parable, but here I'm going to do it. Uh, so be warned. Who's the, uh, who's the bridegroom in this parable? Jesus, the return of Christ. We've been talking, the whole section is uh, from uh, the end of 23, all of 24, and now 25. We're talking about the return of Christ. So this is, uh, Jesus is the bridegroom. He's coming back. Who's the bride? Well, the church. And in this parable, it's the um, five virgins that are ready. The, the, the church is uh, these five virgins that are ready. It's interesting, 10 people in verse 1, well, let's look at verse 1. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Okay, we got 10, 10 people heading out to meet the bridegroom. They, they all think they're going to the wedding banquet. And this is kind of, uh, this is kind of sobering, I think. We want to make sure that uh, we're part of that group that's going to meet the bridegroom and actually go to the uh, wedding feast. Not everybody goes. Not everybody who thinks they're going are going. Let's look at verse 5. The bridegroom was a long time in coming. Did I read 1 through 13? Okay. The, good. Thank you, Bob. Uh, verse 5. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. Uh, it's been 2,000 years, folks since Christ said, I'm coming again. Almost 2,000 years. Um, the church, much of the church has fallen asleep. We, we don't, there's not a general expectation in the church that Christ is coming. There is in certain uh, parts of the church. I was speaking to a fellow just recently who was telling me that uh, he was, doubting the rapture, and his, he was talking to his father, and his father says, no, I don't think. He said, uh, his father said, I've been hearing about this since, I'm a oh, since I was a child, and it's not happening. Well, you know, 
we're these little people. <laughs> I don't know why we think that uh, just because um, just because we've been yearning for the return of Christ and he didn't come, that it's, that it's not a truth that's in the scriptures. Um, I want to read uh, for 2 Peter, the third chapter. 2 Peter, the third chapter. And we're going to start reading in uh, verse 13. <clears throat> no, I'm going to start reading at verse 1. <laughs> Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I have written both of them as reminders to stimul stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. First of all, you must understand. All right, the words that we're going to be hearing have been spoken through the holy prophets in the Old Testament. And uh, Christ Jesus himself commanded through his apostles uh, these words. First of all, you must understand that in the last days scoffers will come scoffing. That's what scoffers do. And following their own evil desires, they will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as, as it has since the beginning of creation. They deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Okay, guys, are we, is the church going to sleep on this judgment thing? He says they for, people forget that this earth was destroyed by God once in a flood, that mankind was, uh, was wiped off the face of the inhabitable earth at one point. And the same word that commanded that destruction, uh, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire by that same word. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we're looking forward to a new heaven and new earth, the home of righteousness. Uh, if we feel that God is slow in keeping his promise, of returning, um, let's just remember that he's slow because he's wanting others to come to a knowledge of him. We're to look forward to his coming every day. The passage we, we read in Matthew there in, in uh, verse 13 says, be alert. We're to look forward to his coming each and every day, but each day he, belay, he delays, we're to thank him. Uh, because the reason he delays is so that others, others can come to a knowledge of him and join us in, in heaven. It's great. And also, look there in verse, uh, we're back in uh, Matthew 25. Matthew 25. Let's look at verse 10. 
while they were on their way to buy oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him. The virgins who were ready went in with him. In the scripture, oil is, is uh, often depicted as the Holy Spirit. So those five virgins, those uh, five young women who had, uh, who I believe are representative of the church, they, uh, they had the oil, they had the Holy Spirit. And so they were able to go in with them. The other five uh, believed they were part of it uh, for one reason or, no, or another. Maybe they attended every week. Maybe they gave lots of money to the church. Maybe they did one thing or another. They believed that they were going to, that Christ was going to uh, uh, take them to himself when he arrived, but he didn't. Only those who had the indwelling, indwelling Holy Spirit, only those who had the oil. I believe this is a rapture teaching here. Uh, and some say that it isn't. Uh, I'm okay with that, but I think it's a rapture teaching. Christ coming, receiving his church to himself. Uh, with that in mind, I want to look at a few scriptures. Uh, we're going to turn first to uh, First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians, fourth chapter. I'm going to start reading in verse 13, the coming. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or grieve like the rest of men. He's talking about uh, death. Uh, falling asleep is a euphemism for uh, death for the believer. Or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Accordingly, uh, to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. So we've got a picture here in uh, the Thessalonians passage of the bridegroom coming, the dead in Christ rise first, and then we who are alive and remain are caught up together with them to meet Christ into the air and thus shall we ever be with the Lord. So we're going to be with him when he comes. And I want to look at John 14, 2 and 3. John, did I say 14? Yes, 2, two and 3. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so... I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. Okay, this is Christ talking. And he says, now, if this isn't, weren't so, I wouldn't be telling you this stuff. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And... Uh, if I go and prepare this place, I'm going to come again and take you to be with me. So we're going, the church is going to be with him. It's going to a place prepared for it. And I want one last uh, passage along this line. I want to look at Revelation 19. This is a picture of uh, uh, the marriage supper of the Lamb, it's usually called. Revelation 19, I'm going to start reading in 7. Hmm. I'm going to start in the last, last, uh, last part of uh, 6. Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. 
For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Then, I'm going to continue reading a little further here. Then the angel said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, These are the true words of God. Okay, so, uh, Christ is coming uh, to receive us to himself, that we can be with him. We're going to go to a place prepared for him. And we're going to go to a, uh, a beautiful um, supper, marriage supper, all those who believe in Christ. And he says, now these are the true words of God. So we've emphasized this a couple of times now. Christ said earlier, uh, if this weren't so, I, wouldn't, I would tell you so. And then in, in Revelation 19 here says, these are the true words of God. Let's look at, uh, back to uh, John, uh, 25th chapter. Matthew, I'm sorry. Back at Matthew, 25th chapter. Verses 11 and 12. Later, the others also came, the, uh, the folks who did not have the oil. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Open for us, they say. I don't know you, he says. Uh, you know what? We have to do this thing God's way. Uh, like my grandson, my dear grandson, says to me, uh, we can say to God, self, self, I'll, I'll do it myself. I'll do it my way. I will do the works that I think will make me holy and acceptable to you, and I'll do it in my timing. I'm not ready right now to commit uh, to uh, Christ. Well, listen, my way and my timing equals disaster, as we've seen in these passages. We need to humble ourselves uh, before God, before our great God who loves us, and we need to... Um, recognize that it's not by our works. By grace we're saved through faith, not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any should boast. Uh, verse 13, therefore keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. The uh, NASB says be alert. You don't know the day or the hour. How can we be on the alert if we almost never think about the coming of Christ. Uh, some of us believe that this is a topic that, uh, that because of all the um, different views on it, is a topic we could kind of just kind of leave in the, in the back drawer. There's more important things to talk about, the salvation, etc. But how can we be on the alert? And, it, and remember, this is Christ talking. Therefore, keep watch. How can we keep watch if we almost never think about the return of the Lord? If we almost never think about Christ coming again? Okay, we're going to go into a second parable here. Uh, I'm going to read Matthew 25, 14 through 30. <clears throat> again, it will be like a man going on a journey who has called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To the one he gave five talents of money, to another two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who re had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with the two talents gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought the, uh, brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things, I will put you in charge of many things. Come 
and share your master's happiness. The man with the two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned I would have have received it back with interest. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten. For everyone who has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. And throw this, that worthless servant, outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What's the main idea here? The main idea is, again, Christ is coming. He's coming back. And it doesn't pay to neglect this truth. Now, it's interesting to me that uh, the guy that had uh, the uh, five talents and the guy that had the two talents, the Lord said exactly the same thing to both of them. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The identical praise went to both of those guys. They were faithful in using whatever God had given them, whatever the Lord had given them, uh, to um, live lives pleasing to him. But we have the guy with the, with the one talent. And I think uh, most of us uh, can see ourselves in the one talent category. category. Uh, how do we motivate ourselves, we who haven't been given as much as some others? How do we motivate ourselves uh, to live godly lives so that we have something to offer the Lord when he returns? You know, we've got all these guys. Uh, we've got a lot of five-talent guys, four-talent guys. The Lord has really, really blessed us. We've, we've, we've had the Billy Grahams, who's old now. We've got the, the Strobels, the McDowells, the C.S. Lewis's, the R.C. Sproul's. We've got all these wonderful teachers. And, and uh, with our modern technology, we've got wonderful teachers from all the ages. All these five talent guys. But how do the one talent people, how do we keep ourselves motivated? See, I believe it goes back to listening to the prophets and Jesus' commands to watch and be alert. Paul says in another place, if we have this hope within us, it purifies our lives. If this is something that we're not thinking about, we lose that, th that element, that help in, in living pure lives. It's good for us to expect uh, the Lord to return and to be alert. We do not want to hear, cast out this worthless slave into outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. We don't want to hear that, folks. <coughs> Um, I'm tempted. Well, I'm going to go down a little rabbit hole here, a little rabbit trail. Uh, where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. I've, I've been asked several times, do I believe there's levels in hell, levels in heaven? Um, I believe there is in a sense. I believe people experience hell differently, and I think it depends on what they how they view the creator's 
uh, rights over the things that he has created. I uh, think back of the story of Lazarus um, and the rich man. They both die. They both go to heaven. Or the rich man the, goes to hell. Lazarus goes to heaven. And uh, the rich man is in torment, the scripture says. And he looks up and he can see Lazarus being comforted. The rich man, he says, ah, ask Lazarus to come down here and give me some water. I'm in torment. And uh, God tells him, uh, there's, a, there's a gulf between you two. It, it can't be crossed. And he says, well, then go, go and tell my brothers uh, about this place so that they don't come here. And uh, what struck me is the rich man has, you know, he's able to, to carry on a conversation. He's able to do rational thinking. Uh, the picture I had as a child of, of flames burning your flesh, I mean, you're, you, you can't be rational at that point. You know, you're not carrying on a conversation. The, these, uh, the rich man, I think, uh, was regretting. He was saying, please go tell my brothers. He, there was regret in his heart. Uh, I think that's covered under the weeping here. The gnashing of teeth. When uh, the exact same word that's gnashing of teeth here is the same word used when the... Uh, when this unruly crowd killed Stephen, the first martyr of the Christian church. The scripture says that they covered their ears and they gnashed their teeth and they ran at him and killed him. So uh, uh, the gnashing of teeth here, it describes uh, not torment from the flames, I don't think, because I don't, well, I don't think there's literal flames. But I, it's, it's uh, uncontrollable rage that the creator of the universe would put one such as I in this place. You have no right to put me here. I did fine according to my definition of fine. So I think, I think that uh, people in hell, they experience hell differently depending on how they view the creator's right uh, to do with them what, they, what he pleases. The rich man, in the story of the rich man and Lazarus, seems to realize he belongs there. And he's regretful. And he wants for his brothers not to join him there. The, uh, I think it ranges all the way from that to this crazy... Uh, anger, fury, uh, the gnashing of teeth. Uh, we'll go on. Sorry about the rabbit trail. 25, Matthew 25, well, from 31 to the end of the chapter. The sheep and the goats. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another, as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom, prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry, and feed you, or thirsty, and give you something to drink? 
When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison or go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or needing clothes, or sick or in prison, and did not help you? He will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Uh, there's God's way. Leads to eternal life. There's our way the way that seemeth right to us. It leads to eternal punishment. My way, my timing, a more convenient time to me, a way more acceptable to me, uh, we got to forget all that stuff. We've got to uh, humble ourselves because there's a precious eternal soul hanging in the balance It's yours. It's mine. And we've got to give up. We've got to humble ourselves. Because uh, Jesus has said twice that we read today, he said, now if this weren't so, I would have told you. In another passage we read where uh, he commanded the apostles to say, certain things, you know, watch, wait for me. Uh, we can't ignore what God is telling us. If we do, we end up uh, in hell. Hell is eternal. Heaven is eternal. There are, there are many people, many groups out there that try to comfort people by uh, telling you that Hell is not eternal. Well, hell is eternal, but when you go there, you die. But I wanted you to notice there in the uh, last verse in, verse, in chapter 25, it says that the, uh, those that, uh, that are not his, they go to eternal punishment. Those on his right that belong to him, they go to eternal joy. They, go to etern they have eternal life with the Father. Those words are identical. Now, the people uh, that believe that, that hell is not real or that it doesn't exist or that it exists but you don't at once you're there, uh, they like to say that hell is eternal but... Uh, that the punishment is eternal, but you aren't. Well, in that one verse, it says it calls the punishment eternal in the same way that it calls uh, our l eternal life in Christ. Uh, it's eternal. You cannot separate the two. You can't, uh, you can't make it a difference. So there is an eternal soul hanging in the balance in each of us that is either going to spend eternity, which is, you know, we can't comprehend that, apart from the loving God, or they're going to spend eternity in his presence. And the scripture says that his right hand are joys and pleasures forevermore. Where do you want to be? I know where I want to be. Uh, all ten of the virgins that we read about at the, in the first 13 uh, verses of this chapter, 
All ten of them wanted to be in heaven. But only five of them had oil. Uh, make your salvation sure, Paul says. Look into these things. Don't ride along and thinking that you're a Christian because your dad was a Christian or because you give so much to the church or because you're such a nice guy generally or one thing or another. Uh, I don't want anyone to uh, be doubting their salvation, um, any Christian to be doubting their salvation because of this message. But I want to shake people loose uh, just because you're a wonderful person, just because we love you doesn't mean you've got the oil. The Holy Spirit comes to those who humble themselves and accept Christ's uh, sacrifice on their, on their behalf. Take care of that today. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.